morning. Welcome to the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to have you here with us this morning for another of our Nixon Legacy Forums. And a special welcome to our C-SPAN viewers. This is the 28th of these Nixon Legacy Forums in which the Nixon administration alum sit down and talk about what it was actually like to be there to work on the programs and policies President Nixon proposed. And it's a real gift to have these men and women share their memories to add to the documentation which the National Archives holds. These are the people who worked on and wrote that documentation. And having them relive those days only enhances our understanding and appreciation for those years between 1969 and 1974, so near and yet so far. These are the kind of memories that help explain the how, the why, and the way things really happened. These are the kinds of details that amplify and illuminate the millions of documents and thousands of hours of tapes that we have at the Nixon Library. The audio and video and transcripts of these Nixon Legacy Forums play a vital and virtually unique part in the oral history that is available to scholars and citizens who want to learn more about our 37th president and his administration. And they're available online and at the library at Yorba Linda. Speaking of Yorba Linda, the National Archives and the Nixon Foundation are beginning the long overdue process of moving the library there into the 21st century. Most presidential libraries are renovated, at least in part, every several years in order to take advantage of the exciting new opportunities available thanks to digital and interactive technologies. With the exception of the Watergate exhibit that opened in 2011, this will be the first renovation of the Nixon Library since it opened 23 years ago. As splendid as it is, it's time for an update, and we expect it will begin later this year. Most of the Nic Nixon Legacy Forums so far have dealt with President Nixon's domestic policies, from the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency and desegregating the Southern schools to taking the bite out of organized crime and overturning almost a century of federal policy in order to guarantee the integrity and rights of American Indians. In May 2011, a forum considered Richard Nixon as Cold War strategist, and a year later the forum looked at Richard Nixon and the geopolitics of the Middle East. But today's forum marks a new direction. Now, in addition to his domestic legacy, the forums will also examine President Nixon's foreign policy. Today we'll begin at the beginning by examining President Nixon's new and unique National Security Council under its new and very unique director, Dr. Henry Kissinger. It's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Shepard, who is the founder of the Nixon Legacy Forums. Jeff is a graduate of President Nixon's alma mater, Whittier College and Harvard Law School. Came to Washington as a White House Fellow assigned to Paul Volcker at the Treasury Department, and then moved to the White House to join John Ehrlichman as an Associate Director of the Domestic Council. Jeff Shepard. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and welcome you also on behalf of the Richard Nixon Foundation. As David said, we co-sponsor these uh, Nixon Legacy Forums, and they they amount to group oral histories, and we make the comparison to the Civil War. We have all the records, David has them, of the Civil War, but what we don't have are, are taped interviews with the participants and the generals and the soldiers asking them why and how they did certain things. And we have the opportunity to do that uh, uh, with the Nixon administration because, by and large, the staffs were quite young. So here we are 40 years later, and we're still walking, talking, and carrying on. So we're going we're gonna to talk today, and this is our 27th or 28th forum, we're going to talk today about the structure of the NSC. And this set, this particular forum goes hand in hand with the transformation of uh, the Bureau of the Budget into OMB and the creation of the Domestic Council. This is the consolidation of policymaking power into the White House itself. And we, we, we call it the Executive Office of the President because it wasn't the White House staff. These are separately budgeted organizations in the Executive Office of the President. We have with us today, and we're very, very fortunate to have KT McFarland, who's going to be our moderator. Uh, uh, KT is uniquely qualified to moderate the foreign policy forums because she started really early. 
as a second semester freshman at George Washington University, needing to work her, her, her way through school, she joined the night typing pool at the, in the West Wing for the NSC. And recognizing the treasure they had, over time, she increased in importance and she, and she became a spokesperson and then uh, served on President Ford's and, and uh, President Nixon's, President Ford's, and then back again uh, under President Reagan. In, in between, she went to Oxford, got a master's degree, and completed all of her coursework for a PhD at MIT, but was called back with to, to, uh, to serve under President Reagan. And today, she's, of course, uh, uh, Fox's national security analyst. So with that as an introduction, uh, KT, welcome, and uh, uh, the, the show is yours. You. Nice to see you. It was great starting my life as a, and career as a, as a clerk typist. And um, for women of my age, that was how you started things. Uh, I wanted to talk, this is, as Jeff has said, this is probably going to be the first in a several part series of the innovations and bureaucratic breakthroughs and how they changed the world in the Nixon administration, particularly Henry Kissinger's National Security Council. It was a particularly fruitful time in American foreign policy. There was the Vietnam Peace Agreement the rapprochement with China, arms control agreements with Russia, and then finally the shuttle diplomacy in the Middle East leading to the first Middle East peace agreements in probably 2,000 years. But what gets lost in this amazing and dazzling series of successes is how President Nixon and his very able foreign policy advisor, national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, transformed the national security decision-making structure on the very first day of the administration. These innovations then laid the groundwork and the foundation for all the successes they were able to achieve in the Nixon presidency. Now, at first glance, you know, you would say, well, what does all that have to do? You know, the structure, that's more about good housekeeping than it is brilliant foreign policy making. But both Nixon and Kissinger, because of their previous experiences, they realized that, as Nixon said, a successful foreign policy, the key to it is the decision-making process. And so both Nixon and Kissinger devoted considerable time by themselves and together discussing how they wanted to structure the National Security Council staff. Nixon had learned firsthand about the importance of a good org chart when he was Eisenhower's vice president. Eisenhower's White House structure was more like the Army General Staff um, than in previous administrations, given Eisenhower had just come off the job as Supreme Allied Commander during World War II. What happened during the Eisenhower administration is that it allowed Eisenhower, this structure, to deal with the day-to-day -day crises as well as to devote more time to strategic planning. Even so, in his memoirs, Richard Nixon complained that a lot of Eisenhower's time was wasted on long meetings. And Nixon, because of his own personal preference to do things on paper and not in person, and in the interest of efficiency, wanted to get briefings and presentations and decision-making process through memoranda rather than meetings. It also, the other shortcoming of the Eisenhower system was because it was the military, a lot of its decisions were making at a much lower level, so by the time the boss got the decision, it was a yes or no as opposed to option A, B, or C. Kissinger arrived from a different set of, uh, a different place. He was an outside consultant to the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, and he saw firsthand the weakness of their foreign policy decision-making process as he saw them. He thought that Kennedy and functioned more as a, his administration and then later Johnson was more of an ad hoc crisis management dealing with the crisis of the day and had less time to devote to, dis to strategic decision-makings. And in the end of the Johnson administration, a lot of their decisions was made by a few people at a regular Tuesday luncheon because Johnson at that point during the, end of the, during the Vietnam War was afraid of leaks. So together, Kissinger and Nixon, from the very beginning, reformed the national security structure. Now, when, you talk, when people talk about the National Security Council, it's important to make a distinction. The National Security Council is something um, mandated by law in the National Security Act of 1947. And there are four members to the National Security Council, the President, Vice President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense. They're voting members. It's sort of like a supra-cabinet. But the National Security Council staff, which is what most people refer to when they say National Security Council, is in fact the staffers who prepare the documents for that top level group. In Nixon's book, he said Eisenhower made the selection of John Foster Dulles as his Secretary of State because he wanted Dulles to be the chief foreign policy decision maker. 
But Nixon said from the outset, he, Nixon, wanted to have foreign policy directed from the White House. Now in his book, The White House Years, Kissinger describes that Johnson administration process that I talked about where it was no central focus, that there was not a lot of preparation of staff work and often decisions were made more or less on the fly. And as a result, as Kissinger says, that the administration became hostage and prisoners to the events of the day and were not able to really formulate and see strategically how they might develop things. Well, Kissinger and Nixon didn't do it all alone, despite what their memoirs might say. The guys who helped them with it and carried it out are in front of you. So joining us today are the men who made it happen. Richard Allen, raise your hand so we know who you are, okay, was a nationally recognized scholar at Stanford University's Hoover Institution when Richard Nixon tapped him to coordinate foreign policy issues for the 1968 Nixon presidential campaign. And then once Nixon became president, Richard Allen became the deputy director of the National Security Council. John Lehman, sitting next to him, was a brilliant young defense analyst when he joined Dick Allen on the Nixon campaign staff in 1968. Once Nixon took office, Lehman became the National Security Council staff's head of legislative affairs and had to man manage the often very testy relationships between the White House and Congress, particularly during the Vietnam War. And if I can put a personal note, John Lehman routinely gave Henry Kissinger headaches for his exploits, notably in the gossip columns of the day as one of the most eligible bachelors in the Nixon administration, a, a role which Henry Kissinger saw more of his, himself in that role. Um, then we're turning to Winston Lord. He, Nixon distrusted most bureaucracies, particularly State Department, Foreign Service officers, but Winston Lord was probably one of the few exceptions. He was a State Department Foreign Service officer, he was in the Pentagon Analysis for, um, Policy Planning Shop, and he joined Henry Kissinger's NSC staff at the very beginning and probably became Henry Kissinger's closest associate throughout the administration. Winston Lord worked on everything from the Vietnam peace negotiations, to the other major foreign policy issues, and particularly the opening to China was created really in that office when Winston Lord would run into Henry Kissinger's office several times a day talking about the opening to China. Winston helped plan and was part of the secret trip to um, Kissinger's secret trip to China in July 71, and he was then central to the implementation of that opening throughout. Winston accompanied Nixon and Kissinger on every one of their China trips. He later became the ambassador to China and was also Kissinger's right-hand man, not only in speeches that dealt with everything from the Middle East to Vietnam to China to Asia to Russia, but also as a close personal confidant throughout. And finally, Bud McFarlane. Bud was a Vietnam veteran and Marine Corps officer. He came to Kissinger's staff in 1971, initially as a White House fellow and then as the military liaison. But like Winston Lord, Bud McFarlane's brief quickly expanded behind, beyond just the military issues of the day. His, he became instrumental in the arms control negotiations with the Soviet Union and then the shuttle diplomacy after the October 1973 war, which resulted in the, in the peace agreements of the time. So with that, I would like to move chairs to here and talk to these gentlemen about their recollections and remembrances ex and the good points and the bad points of how they changed the world. Uh, I would like to start, Dick, with you, because you were the guy with Nixon from the very beginning. You were his sounding board throughout his campaign. Nixon obviously had given a lot of thought to these issues. What prompted him to want to change the NSC system? His experience, as you noted, as vice president, was uh, informed how he would structure things as president. His personality w was such that he insisted on planning, spent hours and hours and hours uh, reading, mostly reading, some writing, and lots of travel before he became president. Uh, he had the opportunity to see American foreign policy uh, in disarray. And he thought that all of the elements of national power should be brought together under the rubric of national security, it's not just foreign policy or our particular policy toward an agglomeration of states, but it's military power, it's economic power, uh, it's our position in the world. It's even down to and including information, uh, how we presented ourselves in the world. We once had a USIA, for example, 
which did a fairly efficient job, although highly uh, criticized. Nixon was critical of USI, wanted to reform it, put Frank Shakespeare in, in charge of it, a CBS executive. So his idea was a comprehensive national security strategy harnessing all of the components. And in order to do that, uh, he spent hours and hours and hours of the time that I knew him, and it was a long time, um, and then as president. And in the transition period, charged Kissinger very specifically, and us with doing just what he wanted to do, organize it, bring decision making back into the White House where it properly belonged. So this was between Richard Nixon getting elected in November of 1968 and taking the oath of office in January of, of 1969. Mm -hmm. So th at that period of time was when you crafted this whole new system. Yes, uh, uh, it was very specifically his wishes that were implemented in the structure that followed. All right, John, let me ask you, in the, in how was it codified? You know, it's one thing to have the meetings and say, we're going to do it, we're going to have everything in the White House, but were there pieces of paper? Uh, what, what was the system that then established this? Because if the White House is going to control foreign policy decision making, what does the State Department, Defense Department, CIA, and everybody else think about it? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think the views of the uh, institutions and the, the cabinet agencies were particularly sought after from, uh, <laughs> from the beginning. And, uh, and, and part of it, you know, if you read uh, President Nixon's biographies, uh, he was so uh, uh, battered by the Washington establishment during his years in the Congress and as senator uh, because he was really viewed as an outsider and particularly going after Alger Hiss was just thought to be a, an unforgivable sin. So he was not particularly trusting of the bureaucracy. Uh, and so uh, he had a very small group uh, and Winston was one of the leaders, along with Dick, during the uh, during the lead up to it, um, in putting together the framework, and then <coughs> having more experienced legal counsels and so forth put the words together to uh, to provide the the actual framework. But uh, uh, the agencies weren't asked until it was uh, 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 baked all baked. Okay, now there's something called, and we see in the, in the archives and the documents, something called NSSMs, NSDMs, and they're National Security Study Memoranda, which are like briefing papers, um, which would be prepared by the agencies um, and then sent to the president. And then there were also National Security Decision Memorandums, whereby the president was making a decision, this is how we wanted it to go forward. Dick, you were, you were part of the group that, and Winston, all of you, in China, and by the way, as your roles are more prominent or less prominent, the National Security Decision Memorandum number two was the one that created this different structure, which in effect put Henry Kissinger in charge. Yes, uh, that was the codification of everything that he wanted. And uh, as a result of discussions during the transition and his own thinking, uh, that's exactly what was written down and that's what he approved. Uh, you'll note on the memorandum, uh, it was approved, or you can see it on the memorandum, that it was approved without any other commentary on the side. There's no penciled notes on, on the right. outside, no modifications, uh, and it was, it was because he had earlier drafts presented to him before he got the final draft. Clean copy in the final analysis. Indeed. Okay, Winston, go, go, jump in with it, because yeah, let, let why and how is this so much different than it had been before? Yeah. Well, first of all, during this uh, period up at the Pierre Hotel in December 68, uh, Kissinger worked with uh, General Goodpast, who had worked for Eisenhower, to get his views on how the system should work, because Eisenhower had his own system, uh, as well as my boss at the time in the Pentagon, who was then taken over to the NSC, Mort Halperin, uh, and Dick Allen and others also contributed. Uh, the key thing about this new system that we're looking at is who chairs the committees. If you chair a committee, you set the agenda, you run the show, you make sure how it's implemented. A and so the big distinction from previous administrations was, in effect, the National Security Advisor was chairing all the key committees. There were six basic committees, one for general foreign policy problems, one for a crisis that it would arise, uh, a defense program committee which related defense to foreign policy issues, a verification panel which looked at arms control, and then two intelligence committees, one 
for intelligence policy and one for clandestine operations. Every one of those was chaired by Henry Kissinger. Uh, now, we should add that there were two things they were trying to accomplish, and this is Nixon driving this, as you said. Uh, one, you wanted some formal structure where every agency had a chance to get their views in, even though the White House was dominating, and, and he wanted real options. The other thing about this system that was different is that Nixon genuinely wanted different policy recommendations and which agency supported it, the pros, the cons, the expenses, the risks. We used to joke, of course, that what we would do is we'd give three options. The first one would be unconditional surrender, the second one would be nuclear war, and the third would be continued present policy. <laughs> so that was, but seriously, these were serious options. Uh, and, and the other thing that uh, you wanted to make sure was that there was a strategy and not just re, uh, reacting to crisis. I'll make one last point. It isn't just the system uh, that dominated uh, foreign policy in terms of the White House and control. You had several factors. You had the president himself, as Dick has outlined, his knowledge and instinct. Secondly, his distrust of bureaucracy, not only uh, whether they would be loyal, which was not really fair, but also whether they'd be imaginative and innovative. They're too often the bureaucracies are slow and they don't take risks. Uh, thirdly, he had the guts to appoint Henry Kissinger, who had worked for his opponent, Nelson Rockefeller, who was a Jewish immigrant from Harvard, uh, everything which you don't associate with, with Nixon. So it was to his credit that he reached out. Uh, then you had Kissinger himself, who was brilliant, a terrific staff, present company excluded, of course, uh, and they all worked harder than the State Department. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then you had issues we'll get into that lent themselves uh, to close-knit operations and secret operations, the three key issues being Vietnam, China, and Russia, none of which were exactly democracies and needed to work with public and parliament. So. These are some of the factors that led to the domination by the White House. Now, I, I want to uh, focus on this because it was different than what came before. Who chaired those? There was obviously interagency conversations and discussions about foreign policy decisions in the Eisenhower yeah. and the Kennedy and the Johnson administrations. But who chaired those meetings? Who was in charge of that interagency well, process? Well, again, I, I want to get uh, butt in here, but you had, uh, and even under the Nixon uh, era, you had an undersecretary, essentially a uh, group that would look at issues sometimes before they got to the NSC, or you'd have regional ones for particular regions that would make their way up to the NSC. But in previous administrations, uh, the key committees were generally ch chaired, I think, by, by the Secretary of State or his, right. his deputy, as opposed to the NSC. And as I said earlier, that's what is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. And then, Bud, you're a military guy, so talk to us from the perspective of the Defense Department and the military. Well, the system was very welcome to the military because the military historically and today plans all the time, looking over the horizon, what could go wrong, what might happen in the Middle East, Soviet Union or Russia now. And so the system that President Nixon put in place, which put a premium on planning, how should we approach East-West or Soviet relations what are the political, the economic, the military dimensions of how we can bring together all the U.S. resources to focus on their vulnerabilities? And by the way, what's the cost of doing option one, option two, and option three? The cost financially, the risks politically, vis-a-vis -vis allies, and so forth. So the military welcomed this system it's fair to say, however, that because presidents have cabinet officers who are strong-willed people normally, you really had to have a very talented staff. And I say that not having been a president at the creation, as my colleagues were here, but when you brought together the experts from the Department of Defense, the CIA, so forth, around a table, they had credentials also. And it was only by dint of the excellence of people like Hal Sonnenfeld, Bill Hyland, Hal Saunders, people who had been practicing diplomats, scholars for decades already that were trusted by Dr. Kissinger and President Nixon when they went to those interdepartmental meetings to forge policy and bring the options back to the president. They spoke with authority. Yes, they were backed by the White House and the President, 
but they were intellectually up to the job. They weren't there as kind of patsies listening to uh, ideas that, that might have been a little bit fringe oriented. So it wasn't only the president who was keenly uh, well informed and a scholar himself, and Dr. Kissinger, who of course had taught this at Harvard for many years, but it was subordinates who really were up to the task of the grit work, the day-to-day -day management of these interdepartmental groups that brought to the president options that really made a lot of sense. He'd pick one, and then they were the people who cracked the whip. After he made a decision about what ought to be our policy towards the Soviet Union, if any cabinet agency began to go off the reservation and vary a little bit, they'd get a call from Sonnenfeld or John Lehman or someone else. In short, it was a disciplined system. It was a system that studied matters exhaustively, came to decisions, and published them. It is almost unique in American history that in those years, everybody in the world and every American could go to the bookstore and get a copy of the national security policy of the United States every year that covered every region and arms control and trade and so forth. So it was not a, a kind of a furtive, close hold, uh, secret operation except when needed, but a rather pluralistic, thorough, well thought out policy throughout the Nixon years. And the successes bear that out. I think we'd all agree, however, that it had some flaws. We can get into that, some drawbacks. And that no system is perfect. Uh, bad systems can doom your foreign policy. But good systems don't guarantee success either. Mm -hmm. The personalities are crucial. And to get back to your earlier point about the contrast, uh, again, nothing is perfect. Depends on what the president wants, above all. Uh, but uh, Nixon and Kissinger felt that the Eisenhower system was good in a sense. It was somewhat formal and you, you had everybody involved, uh, but usually there was only one recommendation to the president, like you often get in the military, where the compromises were hashed out before it even got to the president's desk, whereas Nixon, as I said earlier, wanted real option. And also, I think Nixon felt that Ike spent too many times in meetings and so on. Also, the difference was because Eisenhower leaned heavily on Dulles, whereas Nixon leaned on his national security advisor. On the other hand, under LBJ, you had what they call Tuesday lunches, where the top, you know, the secretaries of state, defense, uh, and the president would get together every Tuesday for lunch because they, they were worried about leaks and they wanted fast-moving decisions. I, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, uh, and that had the advantage of, of flexibility, candor, et cetera. But the disadvantage is since it was relatively ad hoc and informal, that you didn't always have carefully prepared agendas for the lunches, the br principles were not adequately briefed. You had different interpretations of decisions that were made at the lunch and uneven implementation. So they wanted, uh, Nixon and Kissinger wanted to avoid both these extremes. I would make one postscript, or add one postscript here, and, and a second later I'll come back to. But uh, President, Nick, uh, President Nixon uh, had the, the good sense to pick and, and recognize that there was a legislative arm to all of this, and to pick probably the premier fellow who, uh, in, in all of Washington, and that was Bryce Harlow. Bryce Harlow had originally uh, written, among other things, that part of Eisenhower's farewell speech in which he warned of the beware of the military industrial complex. Uh, Bryce then was a, a lobbyist heaven forfend, uh, for Procter & Gamble, Neil McElroy's, uh, when Neil McElroy was chairman, of course McElroy had been Secretary of Defense and was himself a scholar and student of, of national security matters. Harlow was probably this, uh, we have a representative, one of his deputies, Tom Karologos, our colleague, uh, beginning in 1969, uh, 68 actually, and 69 forward, uh, who handled congressional relations knowing that the, 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 the required congressional understanding, congressional funding, <laughs> and of course, approval of the policy. And I think that the Nixon system, 
actually engendered respect on the part of the, the legislature. Uh, they saw that he had a, a plan, a program. He had things in hand, and he didn't waste any time in implementing those. That kind of respect actually built support, that is legislative support, for funding for the programs that were necessary. Without any funding, you're not going anyplace. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I jump in with that, and then I want to go back and say when the point that Winston made where it, the staff was really the best. I mean, they may not have been national figures, but they were the best at their fields. I want to ask each of you how you found your way or how they found their way to you. But, John, jump in to comment. Well, I just, uh, while we're talking about history uh, on this, it's important to understand where the National Security Council came from. It mm -hmm. just didn't happen to uh, come full bloom in the 1947 Act. It was one of the most bitter and contentious periods that makes today's partisanship look like kindergarten. Uh, in the, the years uh, 1946, 47, uh, 48, uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was a bitter struggle uh, for control of policy. Uh, and uh, uh, to understand that perspective, you have to remember that when Franklin Roosevelt uh, took office uh, for the first years of his first term, his uh, White House staff was five people. And his was true cabinet government. Uh, he wanted to hear directly from each of the service chiefs, from uh, the secretaries of the military departments and so forth. So there was, there was no such thing as a national security staff. And that gradually as the war came on and uh, the chiefs became more uh, running back and forth every day during the war, uh, th that, uh, that increased somewhat, but not really, there never was a national security hey, council. Let me just point, they, they were not running back to the Pentagon. The Pentagon didn't exist at that point. No, they were, well, there was the War Department, uh, which by the end of the war was in the five-sided building, and Navy was in the temporary buildings uh, down on the mall, um, which is another side story about how they got kicked out of there, but uh, the fact is that the cabinet officers were the president's advisors, and they met uh, virtually daily uh, during the war. Uh, then Truman uh, came in, and Truman uh, really uh, kind of burned uh, about the way uh, Roosevelt, with his, his powerful persona, and having b had the tenure of four terms, how he was running policy completely, <coughs> and uh, and uh, and particularly Burned also <coughs> in part because he wasn't included yeah. in most of the meetings. No, he was not included, and and he particularly had, as many of us read his, his the memoirs of his great life and the different biographies. Uh, he really, really disliked the Navy and the Navy Department because Franklin Roosevelt always referred to, uh, when he was talking about the Navy, he always used we and us. And when he talked about the War Department, the Army, he talked about them and those guys. And uh, it just drove uh, Truman up the wall. He, uh, Truman called the Navy Department a bunch of fancy dans. And he thought they had much more power than they, they should. And so this led he, to... Remember, he's Secretary oh, yeah, of the Navy, so say, he's very biased here. <laughs> we have to be very careful. Well, just <coughs> Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and for, I had... For I eight had, years, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> under Josephus Daniels, he was, he was very pro-Navy through, through and through. But uh, the fact is that uh, there was an attempt in the Truman White House to seize back control from both the State Department and especially the two military departments. And uh, uh, so there was a huge battle over uh, the consolidation and, and the creation of the Department of Defense. And to skip over a lot of interesting who struck John, the fact is that it was the very strong Secretary of the Navy who really wrote a lot of the 1947 Act as he fought consolidation. And part of creating a National Security Council was indeed uh, his he wrote it uh, with his friends on the Hill, and it was to get control of the way Truman was running policy, trying to consolidate things and uh, 
particularly Clark Clifford and a few other of Truman's aides, uh, the, tru the cabinet, uh, particularly the new Defense Department, the service chiefs, and the State Department were uh, frozen out of the policy. So the NSC was thought up by Forrestal, who became the first Secretary of Defense, and Dean Acheson, the Secretary of State, as a way to ring fence these, these uh, haphazard people over in the, mm. the White House and make uh, get back in control. And the way it was originally organized, it was staffed entirely by uh, uh, serving military officers and foreign service officers uh, on detail over there. There was no budget for a National Security Council staff. And so uh, Truman never used it. He, he resented it. He, uh, he just was furious about the whole establishment of it, so he never used it. Eisenhower turned it into he, a military staff, and then after that it reflected how interested a president was in foreign policy and national security. Uh, LBJ was much more interested in, in civil rights and domestic affairs, although Vietnam became the total obsession. But uh, uh, having a concept, a vision for how the rest of the world should be uh, dealt with was just not, he wasn't interested. So the NSC uh, was very reverted to a very ad hoc uh, Tuesday lunch kind of ad hoc meetings and uh, uh, and so sometimes the serv the uh, cabinet officers had complete leeway on things that uh, uh, he was not interested in and other times uh, they never knew what was going on so it was uh, uh, it was a, a major uh, change and then when President Nixon came in here was a guy who uh, as critics from Watergate have often contended, paid, did not pay enough attention and was not that interested in domestic and social policy. He, he was really interested in national security policy. And in, in, uh, in Kissinger, he found his alter ego. And so their structure, uh, w whatever uh, process was used to build it and, and put it in place, was designed to bring all that back in in an orderly, structured fashion, but controlled by the president. I think it's only fair to point out, uh, there's no question that's all true, and the, the whole theme of this conversation is how the, the president and NSC ran the policy, but uh, none of us would want to denigrate the other agencies. In fact, very many able people who actually took care of a lot of issues that are not quite the highest level of importance to the president, whether it was Latin America or Africa or economic issues, uh, and also, they had to implement what was decided by, uh, by the NSC. So uh, all of us uh, would not deny that the White House dominated, and a lot of secrets that we can get into later. Mm -hmm. But uh, the agency still continued to play a crucial role, including providing the kind of background information that was needed by the president. There is just one little component. Uh, the other point I, I would like to make is that although we find in the memorandum that was submitted to the president the concept of, of including what was then the United States Information Agency in the process. Um, to my utter surprise, I was walking to the very first National Security Council meeting, uh, probably in early February, late January, uh, across the street from the EOB over to the White House on the way to the meeting, I passed Frank Shakespeare, the newly appointed director whom I mentioned of mm -hmm. USIA, and I said, Frank, I'll see you at the, uh, he'd been in the campaign, I said, I'll see you at the uh, NSC meeting. He said, what NSC yeah. meeting? <laughs> and um, I then raised the question of why USIA wasn't in the meeting, and uh, it was simply dismissed. Actually, I think probably Nixon himself didn't mind that the exclusion had occurred. And certainly Henry wanted USIA out because I, I think he didn't like or trust USIA. Now you guys have talked about, you know, the, and certainly others have written about the unique abilities of the people who were on the National Security Council staff. Um, and yet, as somebody has pointed out, I think, Jeff, it was you, everybody was pretty young. I mean, I thought you guys were really old at the time. <laughs> but in <laughs> fact, you were quite young compared to other people who have held those jobs. Why don't you just talk through where, how did well, you we'll find your Bud, way? And let's start with Bud. How did you find your way into the exalted levels of Henry Kissinger's innermost sanctum? Well, I was a Marine officer at the time, 
on active duty, and I'd spent a year working uh, in legislative affairs, and coincidentally, my office was next door to Henry Kissinger's, and I sought the opportunity to be interviewed for his military advisor, and had the good fortune to join, <coughs> and then uh, over time began to focus on working with Wen Lord as handling the uh, intelligence dimension of the relationship with China and the sharing of sensitive intelligence information that the Chinese would tell you was kind of the American card that they played vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. And then a few years later, at the I end of- I point out that to be you know, like Soviet troop deployments and missile capabilities, it was to try to gain the Chinese confidence in the new relationship with us. Yes, it was immensely valuable to both countries, or China, as Wen said. They got periodic briefings on Soviet military deployments, 45 divisions on their border, what was their strength, their readiness, what about naval deployments, what about Soviet aid programs to India, but in short, providing the Chinese intelligence that they could count on that was immensely valuable. And of course, just the perception, if you were in Moscow at the time, that suddenly this was going on, it not only enabled you to, or made you keep 45 divisions deployed on the Chinese border now that the Americans were at least, if not allied, supportive. And those were 45 divisions we Americans and NATO didn't have to worry about in Europe, or at least not as much. I'd like to add too, however, that if uh, copying or replicating is the sincerest form of flattery, the Nixon system, which was virtually adopted part and parcel from 1982 on by President Reagan for decision making was applied in a similar fashion. The wrinkle that I won't spend a lot of time on because we're talking about the Nixon administration, there were very, very strong-willed cabinet officers in the Reagan years who sharply disagreed on just about everything. But President Nixon, excuse me, and Reagan wanted those disagreements to be aired, heard personally in cabinet and NSC meetings, and decisions made the next day or so. But in order to do that, you had to have a strong White House staff that could bring him honest disagreements, analyze the merits of each, get decisions made, publish, and the Nixon model with Dr. Kissinger really established that process that would get the best from the bureaucracy, including the disagreements, options, make decisions, and then oversee the implementation of policy that brought such success in the China opening, the Middle East diplomacy, the arms control agreements, and so forth. And similarly, later in the Reagan years, successful policies that accelerated the collapse of Marxism in the world, an end to the Cold War, reduction of nuclear weapons for the first time in history, but all involving a model very, very similar to the Nixon years. Go ahead, Dick. Did you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, by the way, everybody feel that you well, just- Let me yeah. comment on this. Uh, we won't get into other presidential systems uh, in any depth, but. The basic two patterns, it depends entirely on whether the president wants to run foreign policy or he wants to delegate. I'm oversimplifying because all presidents have to make the ultimate tough, courageous decisions and generally set strategic outlines. But it really doesn't matter whether they were focusing on domestic or foreign policy. So you have, you know, Eisenhower delegating a lot to, to Dulles. You had Ford delegating a lot to Kissinger. But then you'd have Nixon dominating uh, foreign policy. And then you have periods where there was a more even struggle, like Vance and Brzezinski or Scowcroft and Baker. So you've had different, and none of these systems are perfect. They all have their advantages uh, and, and disadvantages. Yeah, I think there's one dimension where um, uh, had we all been able to go back to the creation, we might have uh, called on Tom Korologos a little more to help in the drafting because Congress is hardly mentioned in any of these documents. And um, 
while, uh, while the NSC uh, meetings were and the agendas and the options were really the finest put together uh, ever up to that point, it was one big lack. There was a 500 pound gorilla in the room that was never considered. But that was your job, right? Yeah. That's how I got the job because <laughs> nobody was doing it. So, so uh, in fact, Coralogas came came to one meeting with Kissinger and in his usual diplomatic way said, God damn it, Kissinger, you got to put somebody in, in, in charge of legislative affairs. No, he never would have used words like that. Then taught you everything you know. That's right, yeah. I sat at his feet for the next five years and uh, learned how Congress uh, really ran foreign policy and defense policy, which used to drive Henry right there was another shortcoming. I think Dick Allen's it's pointed this out in somebody else's turn, but the economic dimensions of foreign policy didn't get full attention, uh, at least in the early years. Now, in all fairness, economic power today is absolutely crucial. Look, China's got nothing else but that, but look at its clout. Uh, but in those days, it was less important, but still, it was a lot more important than the respect it got, I think, in the system. Yeah. Well, I would just, in, in, with respect to that, uh, the, the shortcoming became so apparent by 1971 that, that Nixon created the Council on International Economic Policy with an assistant to the President for International Economic Affairs. I know because I was Shanghai to come back uh, to help Peter Peterson uh, actually structure De, uh, De Novo right from nothing uh, and build a Council on International Economic Policy which gave the opportunity for those secretaries, such as commerce and, and labor and agriculture, all of which had international issues that began to burn by uh, 1971. Dumping of uh, Japanese television sets, uh, uh, specialty steels, uh, expropriation uh, of various um, American properties abroad, such as in Chile with Salvador Allende, and worries there. So th that dimension really took off because of Nixon, and we speak of President Nixon as an architectural president, which is the theme of our discussion, the overarching theme of our discussion today, that architecture was put in place. It was also stimulated, one has to admit, uh, particularly by pressure from Congress and pressure from John B. Connolly, who had become Secretary of, of the Treasury and <coughs> was a very strong voice and was often thought to be Nixon's uh, prospective successor. Uh, can I just say for the, for the record, uh, the person that everybody seems to be referring to who is not on this stage is Tom Coralogos, who's sitting in the front row. <laughs> and he was the assistant to the president for legislative affairs in the Nixon administration, one of the inner circle in the White House. And so wave your hand, Tom, so the cameras can record you for posterity. <laughs> and <laughs> um. uh, <laughs> We haven't dealt with crisis. Crisis. So. Okay, th that was the next thing I wanted to go. So Kissinger and Nixon set up this system where all the agencies had a role. Their role was to contribute to these national security study memoranda called NSSM, NISMs, and those then were presented to President Nixon with a cover letter written by the assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, Henry Kissinger, and as Wynne Lord said, there was always several options the two unacceptable ones and the one that, no, but the three options, and they would reflect oh, at tab A. Four, five, or one or two. I want to yeah, but there were, but at tab odd, A would be the secretary. <laughs> always an odd number. Always an odd number. Um, so there was always a tab A is the State Department recommendation, tab B is the Defense Department recommendation, tab C maybe is the Secretary of Treasury weighing in. And then Kissinger would also recommend the pros and cons and say, however, I recommend option B, whatever. So the NSC was all of a sudden getting a vote that was really co-equal, if not superior, in some ways, to the agencies. Um, Winston, you made a, have a, made a point in, in your writings that this system not only was unique to Nixon and Kissinger, but it was the issues of the time that required it. By centralizing the study of issues and then the decision of issues, it really suited itself to this concentration of power in the White House because of the countries and issues we were dealing with. Well, Could I would elaborate? separate out two things. One, you've just been mentioning about this really was an uh, intellectually stimulating system. Because the, the studies by the agencies, I might add, as well as, as put together, and that was one of the jobs I had when I was there, uh, these briefing books, these were real options with real implications. But there was a strategy first before you got the specific choices 
Uh, and so that was true of almost every issue. Now, what you're referring to is the three most urgent issues that Nixon faced when he came into office were trying to open up to China, uh, arms control and detente generally with the uh, Soviet Union, uh, and ending the Vietnam War. And as I mentioned briefly earlier, in each case, uh, you were dealing with something that was very little economic component, I might add, that was urgent uh, and was you were dealing with a, a, a very closed society, the communist uh, dictators in effect, who didn't have to worry about public opinion in parliaments, and therefore all three of these issues lent themselves to delicate negotiations out of the public spotlight because you'd have domestic criticism to all the sensitivities of these three issues, uh, and therefore it sort of lent itself to the Nixon-Kissinger approach of dealing uh, I have to say in many cases secretly, we ought to get into the secrecy issue at some point. Yeah, yeah. But the very nature of the issues at the outset of the administration lent themselves to White House control uh, and, and, and secrecy. And that had pluses and minuses, but it was part of the reason that they went about the uh, diplomacy in this way. With respect to the, the opening to China, it's, uh, it's also important to recognize that <coughs> Mr. Nixon wrote an article uh, in October for the October 1967 issue of Foreign Affairs. It was actually written during the summer of 1967. And uh, he wrote it almost entirely himself with people like Pat Buchanan, Ray Price, uh, uh, Richard Whalen. I participated in this as well, although I was distant at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. But this article really telegraphed the opening to China. Nobody paid any attention to it. When the article appeared, uh, it was quite cryptic. If you go back and read it, it's called Asia After Vietnam. If you go back and read it, you'll see that Nixon calls for a series of summit meetings uh, and makes direct hints about opening to Asia, but nobody picked it up, and he didn't elaborate on it. Some people later thought uh, that it, he was really referring to Nixon's secret plan for Vietnam, which, of course, was a canard anyway. It, it, he, he never had a never said he had a secret plan for Vietnam, but that's what it became in, in the press literature. And uh, that initiative was in place. Now, in one of the very first meetings as president, um, I participated and I was walking out with Henry, and I don't know, perhaps you were also walking out of this meeting as well. It was in the first days of the administration. And as we approached the door, RN said to, uh, and by the way, find a way to get in touch with China. And that was the last remark, we're out the door from the Oval Office, walking down the hall, <coughs> and Henry muttered, is he crazy? <laughs> well, he himself became the, the, the vehicle. He uh, found a way uh, to get in touch with China. Found a way to get in touch with, with China. Well, it, was, it, it actually was beyond that. Uh, on February 1, 1969, one week after, essentially, after the inauguration, Nixon sent a memo to Kissinger codifying what you just said, he, I didn't realize you'd said it verbally, and mm -hmm. saying in effect, find a way to get in touch with the Chinese. Now, this was clearly a Nixon initiative. I will say Henry ag agreed with the co concept as well. It's not as if he was, he may have said, how the hell am I gonna do this? But he certainly agreed that the opening to China would help us with the Russians, would do a lot of other things we can uh, save for another meeting. Uh, but there's no question that this was one of Nixon's basic impulses from the very beginning sending a memo within one week of his inauguration. By the way, he didn't have a secret plan for Vietnam, but his basic approach was to use the Russians to squeeze Hanoi. <laughs> so that was what he meant by a secret plan. At least yeah, I'm yeah. trying to construct the best possible uh, <laughs> right. version of this. Um, Except there was none during 1968. <laughs> now, you, you've all talked about sort of how Kissinger and Nixon got control of the bureaucracy. But talk to us about how Nixon and Kissinger let the world know that the action was in the West Wing at the White House and not necessarily at the other agencies. In that first memorandum, there is a recommendation uh, for an annual statement, of, as Winston Lord pointed out, uh, and the annual statement became very important. That's what, and Bud mentioned it too. Uh, a person could go to any bookstore, actually the government printing office, <laughs> um, and get a copy of the, the statement, which was a declaration of American principles and policy that was valid for the year and beyond. It was a statement of strategic uh, goals and, and uh, objectives. That was really 
fundamentally well, important. We, we beat our brains out uh, doing this uh, over Christmas in San Clemente <laughs> every year. It, it would be issued that's in February. That's right. Uh, the trouble is they had a lot of thoughtful stuff, including signals and strategy, but the press was only interested in Vietnam. So all the questions and the attention was on the Vietnam section. But for example, in China, those reports gave a lot of indications of the direction we were going to take with China. Yeah. Uh, and people sort of overlooked it. Uh, and, and but this, these documents are very, <coughs> very yeah, important. Yeah, it shows you what drives press coverage right. of real substantive policy issues. You know, I think it's worth talking about this for a little bit longer. This is one of the first times an administration had said publicly, and not just in sort of boilerplate bureaucracies language, but specifically laid out, this is how we see our policy here. This is where we want to go there. And Kissinger and Nixon would assemble, I know Bud, you were part of it, Winston, you were part of it, would assemble the top four or five guys and spend a week in San Clemente and hammer out what was really the white paper on Nixon's foreign policy. And it was done throughout the Nixon presidency, and I don't think it's really been done since in that kind of strategic, not only well, here's what's happening today, but here's strategically where we want to go. I should comment, but one last introduction on this was that uh, although it didn't get the uh, uh, attention in our press and, and domestic audience that it should have, foreign governments read it very carefully. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was very important for that reason. But it was a real agony. And Kissinger, of course, he tried drafting a speech or a document for Kissinger. And, uh, it's, you say agony and ecstasy. I don't know where the ecstasy <laughs> was. But I used to, since he always rejected first drafts as being inherently worthless, but I did one, one of these foreign policy, I was doing a section, uh, I think, on Indochina. It was about 30 pages, my, my first draft. So I put, I think he didn't even read the first draft. He's going to reject it because it was a first draft, right? <laughs> so uh, on page 15, in the right in the middle, in the middle of the paragraph, I put in a sentence that was grammatically correct, but consisted of the titles of all of Kissinger's books. <laughs> <laughs> and I figure if he, he's going to miss that, I'm going to point out to him that, in fact, he wasn't reading this very carefully. Unfortunately, he caught it. But, uh, <laughs> Anyway, I wanted you to chime in. <laughs> you know, thus far we've talked about the planning, the thoroughness to put in writing American policy for every part of the world. And that planning was really a, an important quality of President Nixon and the system. But of course, there are things that happen that you don't anticipate, wars, crises overseas that involve American interests. So what do you do when you have a crisis? And that was equally as impressive as the long-term planning and the way that President Nixon organized his team. Probably the most salient example during his presidency was the Yom Kippur War in October of 1973. Dr. Kissinger had just been appointed and confirmed as Secretary of State. So the system for decision-making was as it had been centered in the White House and remained so. I mention this primarily, however, because it did end well. You can go and read about that, and you can see one of these forums like this one focused entirely on that Middle East war. I mention it for a different reason, and it was the resilience, strength, really, of President Nixon well, remember the circumstances. Here was an American ally, Israel, attacked from two sides, Syria and Egypt, and losing. And it looked for about a week's time as though Israel was going to suffer a, a pretty serious defeat. President Nixon, however, here, seeing the importance of avoiding that catastrophe, was himself besieged by the Watergate problem, challenge. Back over a year now into this worsening crisis and attack by members of Congress and others and the press, and an ally was about to go under. So it required a personal composure and vision of where he wanted this to end to be able to continue to manage this NSC system with the aid of Dr. Kissinger and subordinates in the State Department as well as defense. Bear in mind that in addition to the pressures of Watergate, his vice president was about to resign. 
Separately, the Soviet Union, who had its own interest in trying to get back into the Middle East, was looking for ways to undermine American policy to the point of even alerting seven airborne divisions to go back into Egypt and to tip the balance in favor of Egypt. You had threats by the Arab countries to impose an oil embargo, which would or could have brought down not only our economy, but the global economy. And so this is not your average afternoon walk in the park if you're the president facing these kind of stresses. But throughout, and indeed the vice president did resign in that first two week period of October, the president was there to make the decision and there was never any question about who was in charge. The reallocation of things coming off the Defense Department production line for American units were just sent immediately to Israel. The battlefield was turned around so that Israel could avoid being defeated. But then the evolution of any crisis, in this case a tipping of the balance in favor of Israel, which almost brought in the Soviet Union's airborne divisions, required the composure to go to a nuclear alert on the American side, a la 1962, or almost. All this by a president under siege, with no vice president, the possibility of an Arab oil embargo, but there, like a rock, making decisions and assuring that this came out so that in the aftermath, not only was the security of Egypt and the Arab states restored to a measure of stability, but an opening was created for the first time since Israel became a state for a dialogue with an Arab leader, Anwar Sadat, who had the statesmanship and character to be willing to engage against the counsel of every Arab country, to engage with Israel and lay the foundation for the first peace treaty between uh, Israel and an Arab state. A president, however, able to do that, notwithstanding all of the pressures he was under, through this system that he ran, he managed, regardless of his own personal circumstance, through the excellence of Dr. Kissinger, now his Secretary of State. He also wore the other hat as NSC advisor at the same time. That's right. He could write a memo to himself uh, from the Secretary <laughs> of State. Uh, but another, another point there, and we'll get back to these other issues, uh, the President and Kissinger had the, uh, the guts and the intelligence to realize that just as Israel needed to restore the balance after suffering a defeat for a week or two, they didn't let Israel wipe out the Egyptian army because that would have made psychologically difficult for the Arabs to negotiate. Right. So they, they, they struck and had a ceasefire, and I was involved in that. We went to Moscow uh, at, at a time where the Arabs, for the first time, had enough success against Israel. They had some dignity and self-respect to negotiate. Israel was sufficiently chastened and lo losing some of its hubris about overwhelming superiority because they had trouble. So both sides were, were ready to negotiate. And so that you not only have to manage the crisis, to figure out how you come out of it. Now, on the crisis issue, we had a specific committee, one of the six that Henry <laughs> chaired, called the West SAG, and that was specifically for crises. And that would only work if you had a couple of things already intellectually in place. One, a strategy for the region where the crisis breaks out. So you're not quite sure. It's not like it's a recipe that you're going to pull out and say this is going to work. But you do some contingency planning uh, and you think about a, a region uh, strategically early on. So when a crisis breaks out, you at least have some background in which to maneuver and to tailor your tactics to. Uh, and so you needed this committee, but you also needed the more formal system in advance. Well, why don't you for a minute talk about what that crisis management team was, who was on it, who, who called it, and then also, if John, if you could weigh in, what role did Congress play in any of this? I mean, because Congress was crucial for, as, as Dick pointed out, if they didn't give the budget, if they didn't have the money, some of these things would never have happened. Well, it was chaired, of course, like everything else, the, the committee was by Henry. Uh, you would have state, defense, CIA, joint chiefs, uh, present. If there was an economic dimension, you'd have them present. Uh, 
so that was the basic. Uh, and that would meet in the White House situation? Yeah, well, yeah, just like all these other committee meetings, but this was specified uh, for crises. Now, the way that this would work and the way most of these NSC meetings would work, it would start out with a briefing by CIA to give the intelligence background. Then Henry would give the overview, including the options involved, and then each of the agencies would present their views and, and why they backed a particular option. Nixon, of course, like most presidents, would make a decision at the meeting. He would listen and then go off and, and think about it and make his decision later. And then was, was Congress ever brought in? Well, <coughs> yeah, uh, let me talk a little bit about Congress, but first, the effectiveness of this five years, which has, I don't think, ever been uh, matched, was due in no small measure first to the, the concept of the president and Henry as how it should run, and that resulted in the recruiting of some truly first-class, unusual people, and it was kept small. Uh, if my memory serves me, there were only about 30 professionals mm -hmm. uh, on Kissinger's staff. And there were, I think, a, a, a total, including admin people, of only about 120. And uh, that was why it was so effective, because it was very agile. It could move quickly. It could, it, it, all of the uh, uh, professional staff members' calls were answered by whomever um, uh, whomever was being called, whether it was a cabinet secretary or a Senate uh, foreign relations chairman. And so, in, particularly in crisis, things move very quickly and very credibly. Now, you contrast that with, and I, I really believe as much as I, I, there are very strong things to say on the Reagan system, which was really a, a, a version of the Nixon system, but that was clearly the apogee of the National Security Council as a structure that functioned. And it was because it was very high quality, it was very small and very agile. And if you look at the 120 of this apogee of, of how the system should work, compare it today where the number is 1,700. Uh, we had one. Wait a minute, seven, I just want to repeat that. 1,700 members of the National yeah. It's just a number. <coughs> Seventeen hundred. When we uh, uh, when we we were on the National Security Defense uh, QDR Commission two years ago, that's what it was. My guess is Quadrennial Defense Review. Mm, oh yes. Quadrennial, Quadrennial Defense, Defense, Defense Review. Review. <laughs> excuse me. Um, Dick so has the National always been I just want to just I think this is a really significant point. So the National Security Council staff, which when you guys started out with Kissinger, nineteen sixty nine was probably 10 people, and it may have gotten up to 30 professionals by yeah. the time Kissinger, by the time the Nixon administration was finished, and maybe as many as 80 or 100 people, and that counts everybody from me typing the President's Daily Brief to Henry Kissinger, so the entire staff might have, would probably be around 100. You're now saying it is 1,700 all uh, in. Uh, no, I'm astonished I, by that figure. I no, am I, just blown I, no, away. I, where uh, are they all, John? It, oh, I'll tell you where they are. First. When we were there, uh, we had uh, some people down in the basement of, of the little White House yeah, that's West where I Wing. I was. That's where you were. A that's where you A few people were. on the first floor. That's where you were. And then we had about, as I recall, three quarters of one floor right. on the, the old executive, EOB. Executive office building. Uh, the executive office building. Today, they have taken over basically what used to be called the new EOB. Yeah. Uh, that is filled with. Uh, uh, NSC staff. So it's become another institution of government and it's, uh, it's very bureaucratic and they, you know, they still have plenty of good people but they're embedded in a huge bureaucratic system so it does not function today the way it, uh, it did in either the Reagan or uh, and to a certain extent in the, in the Carter years but uh, the height of its effectiveness was uh, was the Nixon administration, and they were because it was lean and uh, and could respond and quickly to crises. Yeah, yeah. making a, a, a point that's a little bit off topic here, but uh, one of the things that drove President Nixon crazy was leaks, and um, the case can be made. In fact, I'm making that case. John will remember from 
1969 particularly, that ultimately it was this concern and passion about stopping leaks that led to Watergate. It was a direct connection. In 19, early 1969, there was an odd little item mentioned that Stener Senator Stu Stuart Symington was going to create a subcommittee on American commitments abroad. And uh, I happened to read it, and John and I discussed it, and there, thereupon began a, a, a long effort that culminated in the fall of 1969 in about a 70-page memorandum, which I believe that same topic you turned into a doctoral dissertation at Cambridge, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> uh, and uh, we presented this memorandum. Oddly enough, it, uh, the memorandum was not acted upon. It just went into limbo. Uh, in 1971, however, when I was preparing to come back to the White House, uh, Bob Haldeman, then President Nixon's Chief of Staff, called me in, in Denver when I was preparing to return to set up the Council on International Economic Policy with Peter Peterson and said, uh, the President remembers your memorandum from 1969 and would like to implement it and wants you to implement it. I said, no, no way am I going to do that because among the other recommendations are review, we're reviewing everyone's security clearances and I wanted, I personally wanted no part of reviewing anybody's security clearances. Uh, I didn't want to see raw data. But the leakage came just as much from inside the White House <laughs> as, it, as it did from the bureaucracy. It was the bureaucracy that Nixon distrusted and Henry also distrusted but in reality, there was just as much leakage coming right out of the this NSC. Yeah, and this gets to uh, the secrecy and back this, channels and yeah, all the rest. It was a major feature of this system uh, was secrecy. And there were pluses and minuses. Uh, I've already suggested that the three most urgent issues lent themselves to secret, tightly held negotiations. The dangers as a general principle, and even on these issues, and I can give illustrations, that if you're secret and you cut other people out, leave aside the morale and, and humiliation and so on, you may not get the full expertise of the other agencies to get you ready for what you're secretly negotiating. Now, we used to try, for example, in the China opening, get briefings on China generally, even though we were secretly going to China in a few weeks, nobody knew about it, but we could still ask as a general proposition, the president would like to know more about Mao Zedong or Zhou Enlai or their policy toward Taiwan or the Soviet Union and so on. Uh, so that's one disadvantage. Another disadvantage is if you carry out something secretly uh, and then you announce an agreement, the agencies that were cut out in the first place are all going to be tempted to say, oh, we could have done a hell of a lot of better job. You, you left this out or if you'd known about this and our expertise. So that's the risk you run. Now, the system was awkward, humiliating, uh, uh, but it produced terrific results. So you, uh, and, and one of the problems was wh where it led. I'll give you one example of extreme secrecy. On the secret trip to China, we had a public trip to Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan. We were on a small plane, and uh, there were three types of people on that plane. There were four of us who knew we were going secretly to China, because the trip was public for these other reasons, uh, other countries. There were two or three that knew we were going, but weren't going in with us, but they had to stay behind in Pakistan and cover the, the secret uh, journey to Beijing. And then there was all the other ones who were there for India, Pakistan, and the other issues, and didn't know anything about the China. So I was in charge of the briefing books, and I had to keep sets, three different sets of briefing books. <laughs> one for the four of us, one for a slightly larger group, and, uh, and so, of course, I would update them and go exhausted to sleep. Henry's been napping. He would wake up, he'd look at him, and he wanted all three chains all over again and so on. So this, this is the absurd. Now, the advantage on China was that if you had a lot of publicity about the opening of China, although we did send public signals, as we discussed, the Taiwan lobby, the, 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 the anti-communist uh, extremists, uh, other allies would all be weighing in, and you'd be hemmed in before you could even see whether you could strike a new posture with the Chinese and your agenda would shrink, and, and so you would be constricted. And of course, it was a dramatic opening. But the disadvantage was, for example, the State Department criticized the Shanghai communique a little bit because they weren't involved in it. In the case of Vietnam, you needed secrecy to have real negotiations. If you have a public forum like we had in Paris, it's just propaganda barrages from both sides. So you needed secrecy to have real candor and people to take risks. 
The danger was, and we paid for it, is that we were making offers to end that war from the very beginning to the Vietnamese uh, that were beyond what the New York Times editorials were calling for. We were being very moderate. Uh, Hanoi was totally intransigent, so we paid a real public uh, price because nobody knew we were negotiating with the Vietnamese, let alone what kind of proposals we were making. And finally, in the Soviet Union, the other one that Kissinger did secretly, he negotiated with some help from the arms control community, uh, SALT one, the first big treaty. But of course, he got criticized later for screwing up in a few details that if he involved the bureaucracies, he wouldn't have made so many mistakes. So there were plus, I would say the pluses won uh, and outweighed the minuses because look at the results. But you did pay some price, uh, not only in human terms, but in terms of uh, bureaucratic strife. You know, and also, were there, in, in, not in the case of China, but in the case of the arms control negotiations with the Russians, the Soviet Union, and with the Vietnam peace agreements, there were, in fact, public formal negotiations right, that were going on, run by the State yeah. Department, and, and yet you guys were doing the secret back-channel trips where you were doing the real heart of the negotiation was right. here, but the media and Congress and everybody could focus there. And you paid a price because the, the, the public ones looked meaningless and nobody realized we were really making a real effort to end the war, for example. But you should con comment on the arms control part. Well, I was going to add to your own point when about the China negotiations. I mean, people to this day applaud the policy. And they said, did it really have to be secret? Well, consider this. At the time, China was killing in the Cultural Revolution that literally tens of millions of its own people. Now consider the left wing in our country, every American really, would have been revolted by the idea that we're going to be engaging and trying to foster relations here with a country that's doing that. The right wing could have said, look, these, this is a country that's providing the AK-47s to Vietnam, killing Americans right now. This is a country that's in chaos, literally, internally. So if you had said, well, let's float that idea in public and see what people think about it, it would have been strangled in the crib, for Plus sure. Plus we'd be selling out Taiwan, which we didn't, by the way, but go ahead. That's uh, right. Yeah. So if you're going to take the country in a profoundly new direction of any piece of public policy that is vulnerable to being heavily criticized, as these particular ones were, later on it came to a similar thing, but I won't digress on the Reagan years, but it had to be in secret or it could never have developed as the success that it was. The gains that we made today, well, well that's self-evident. Of course that was a good idea, but it would never have happened without can, can it. I we, did, we did pay a price with Japan and some of our NATO right. allies, but it was temporary and we couldn't have consulted them. That would have leaked and, and so, just reinforcing your point. Let, let me turn to you, John. By the time Kissinger then became Secretary of State, the sort of the other major accomplishment was the Middle East shuttle diplomacy. And that was done in public. I mean, everybody knew Kissinger was shuttling back and forth. Yeah. Is, is, is the secrecy part of it and the NSC and Henry Kissinger did not go on the Sunday talk shows to talk about American foreign policy, was that sort of all piece of, of the secret negotiations, the agility, all the rest, and yet once he became Secretary of State, he had other more public responsibilities and had to be done in the public eye. Well, let's come back to that uh, because okay. I never answered your question about Congress, which bears directly on secrecy. I think uh, Henry's attitude to Congress when he first came in uh, was the same as Admiral Ernie King, who was the new CNO uh, that Roosevelt put in at the beginning of World War II. And he was known to be a pretty brusque character. And he was his, uh, there's a whole bureaucracy in the Navy of, for congressional liaison called OLA, Office of Legislative Affairs. And his OLA, an admiral, came to him and he said, now here's what we have planned for you to brief the committees. He said, I'm not briefing any committees. Well, what should we tell them? Tell them nothing. And when the war is over, tell them who won. <laughs> and I, I, think, I think that was Henry's, uh, attitude towards Congress. That's why the, you don't see it in any of the preparatory uh, doctrine, but he's a fast learner. And uh, pretty soon he was finding uh, Congress intruding and attacking on every uh, 
level. And luckily, he had three of the finest tutors that have ever been in the job, and Tom Corlogas and Bill Timmons and uh, Bryce Harlow. And so he pretty soon realized that he had to start dealing with these people. <coughs> Not to mention the f Congress approved the NSC budget. Yeah, <laughs> right. And uh, so it was an unending uh, crisis and battle uh, uh, from the first day until uh, Henry went to state, and then it took on another level. But it was, uh, it, it, he, he he turned out to be a natural um, because he learned so quickly that uh, you, you uh, first can't tell him nothing, uh, and, but you have to be careful who you tell what to. And, uh, and so to summarize a, a lot of different crises, he was, he was able to uh, manage, and, and people think that they're polarized today, Congress is polarized today, There's was nothing, nothing else, compared yeah. to those days. Right, Tom? I mean, the bitterness between, uh, between the Democrats and Republicans, particularly on the Vietnam War, was just cut it with a knife, and people weren't talking to each other. Yeah. And uh, as we forget on whose watch the Vietnam War started. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it was- If you're political about it. But at that point, you know, that's, that's in the past. There were also and half a million people across the street on the mall, students demonstrating. There was civil yeah. unrest. Oh, yeah. Re well, Washington. remember? Yeah. We had to come in to uh, work, crawl under the buses that surrounded the whole <laughs> White House. Remember yeah. that? Uh, but uh, the price we paid was the secret negotiations, which we had to do. But yeah. the, I'm not saying the demonstrations would have gone away if they know we made these offers. But it, it would have helped. Because I remember I had all my... All my liberal friends were beating up, and why aren't you guys even negotiating with the Vietnamese? Meanwhile, I just come back from yeah. a two-day two meeting in Paris. But you, you, know. couldn't, you couldn't tell that to the uh, committees right. because Henry rightly knew that particularly uh, the uh, Foreign Relations Committee was a sieve. And so, uh, so they, since they felt very early on they weren't getting really what was happening, uh, a bill was introduced to make Henry, uh, to subpoena him to testify and to uh, then go further and make him subject to Senate confirmation. So basically, uh, we came up, Tom leading the fray, with a strategy uh, to give them inside skinny briefings with no staff present and uh, uh, the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, nothing in writing, but uh, to stroke them so that they were getting the truth of what was going on to a point. And so that enabled them to take care of, uh, uh, of the not looking uh, totally out of the picture. Then he would quickly, Tom would take us over uh, to uh, the minority caucus and Henry was, I think, brilliant in being able to talk about the uh, half empty part of the glass to, to those uh, uh, constituents. And so uh, throughout the rest, he realized very soon that uh, he had to treat with Congress and make deals and deal with crises uh, uh, just as important as uh, dealing with the Chinese or uh, uh, the Soviet Union because he almost single-handedly had, uh, had to block uh, legislation that was constantly being proposed and easily getting a majority of signatures. And uh, uh, so uh, that, uh, that could be a, a book, a very thick book in itself. Uh, and the secrecy, uh, it, it very much elided into how, as he became more and more known, uh, particularly after the China announcement, hey, whoa, Who's this, this guy? guy's really... <laughs> Uh, we got to watch this guy. It was harder and harder for him to do uh, secret kinds of, of things. So he was in the Middle East, uh, uh, the shuttle diplomacy, um, it was much more than, uh, public than he would have preferred. But even there, and Winston would know uh, more in detail, there were several layers of what was going on. Uh, in addition to the public. But that was essentially a State Department operation. He was Secretary of State in most of these yeah. shuttles. And yeah. so that, that was a different, that was under Ford uh, and as well as Nixon. So yeah. 
It was a definite buy. Let us um, also not neglect that dimension of Washington that is so terribly important, the style section of the Washington <laughs> Post. And Henry um, quickly discovered that he could be socially active, shall we say. And I think it may have been the interview with Oriana Falacci, the um, Italian newswoman. Be very who, beautiful. Uh, who was you know, ex Siren, exceptionally beautiful and yes. charming. And uh, it was, uh, it, it, in that interview, as I recall, he spoke about riding into town as uh, John Wayne would or a cowboy would on a horse with yeah, six This is an unfair attack on Kissinger, <laughs> by the way, who was not a secret swinger, by the way. But he, he once, we were in Paris for a secret negotiation, in this case with the Vietnamese. He, he, he snuck away from the embassy. We were in Paris for another reason. And Henry had to sort of camouflage why we were there. So he left me and John Negroponte back to, to help draft the peace agreement while he went out to dinner with a beautiful blonde. So everyone paid attention to that and not <laughs> why we were in town. So. These are, very, these are very important. He was sacrificing himself for the style section. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say it wasn't useful. <laughs> it could also that be was enjoyable. That and he's sticking to it. <laughs> as as a, just a, a, a added Philip, uh, one of the reasons that he kept such a, an effective staff was that uh, the people that he uh, really wanted and didn't see as a threat, he was totally loyal to. And uh, uh, he sent me off once to, uh, to uh, a dinner, an off the record, uh, how naive I was in those days, uh, dinner with a foreign service officer to talk about how we could improve security because leaks were every day in the, uh, and, uh, in the um, uh, above the fold Washington Post front page. So I dutifully did that and, uh, and said, you know, we have the same problem with, uh, uh, with uh, Senator Fulbright and the Foreign Relations Committee. Mm. Next day is uh, above the fold headline, Kissinger aide attacks Fulbright for leaking. <laughs> and so which said, he was oh, doing. <laughs> which he was doing. But <laughs> so uh, with that, and, and, and uh, I get a call from Al Haig, Henry wants to see you. So of course, we were, I was in the EOB. I figured, well, what am I gonna do? This is gonna I, not be a good meeting, you could tell. Yeah, right? well, where am I gonna work after this? <laughs> uh, and uh, so I come in and he says, go on in. And Henry's sitting there at his desk. And he said, Lehman, the Secretary of State has said that you must be fired, that you are poisoning relations, which he has been working on for years uh, to improve relations with Senator Fulbright. And so I was called into the president's office and uh, uh, President Nixon said, uh, I, you know, I know Bill called you he called me and he, he said, um, uh, you should be, um, uh, you should fire this fellow Lehman. And, uh, and Nixon said, uh, well, what do you think, Henry? And Henry said, uh, I was thinking of promoting him. <laughs> <laughs> could, could I pick and up Nixon one point? Said, I know we're, we're probably <laughs> wrapping up, but it gets back to the system. You made a very important point about it. neither Nixon nor Kissinger wanted yes men or yes women, much fewer. Uh, they wanted honest points of view and debate before a decision was made. But then they asked that once the decision is made, if you're on the losing side, you carry it out loyally, neither leaking nor, and if you feel really strongly, you, you, you resign. When I first was interviewed by Kissinger to join the staff, that's what he talked about. I want strong views, but uh, once we decide something, carry it out. And frankly, that's how I got to be a special assistant because the first year, in 69, I was in the executive office building. And one of the things we did was send memos to Kissinger's mini policy planning staff on contingencies and devil's advocacy. And I sent him a couple, which my boss, Halpern, let me send on my own, criticizing some of our policies. And frankly, that's why Henry was sufficiently, I guess, impressed with the argument, even though he disagreed with it, that they then made me a special assistant. That just mm -hmm. underlined the fact that 
Nixon and Kissinger both wanted fierce debate and real options, but then they wanted loyalty once you've made a decision. Yeah, I think we're needing to sort of wrap this up, so I'd love to get everybody's final thoughts on the NSC, the structure, and how it worked and why it succeeded, and particularly to ask you two, Dick Allen, and Bud McFarlane, who then later became National Security Council advisors to President Reagan, how the system, you know, did it work? Was it just something that only worked with Nixon and Kissinger, or did it work effectively going forward from that? So I'll let you guys think about it. And John, do you want to wrap up your final thoughts? Well, I believe that, uh, that, that the national security system has never worked uh, as well before or since, even in the Reagan uh, years for different reasons. Um, I, I, I think perhaps uh, a combination of the way, uh, the way it operated a after Kissinger became Secretary of State um, it, it, it would be a way to improve on it in the present day uh, because the cabinet officers need to be included in the, the real decision making. And if you keep them totally excluded the way, for the most part, they were, they go off and do independent steaming. Uh, steaming. I mean, uh, Mel Laird was always cutting his own deals with Congress and not telling Henry or anybody else about them uh, because he was cut out of the, mm -hmm. right. the inside mm -hmm. game. So there, there would be ways to Im improve on it. But uh, uh, again, it, you could talk all, uh, I, I, I think Wynn put it perfectly, that uh, really good people can make any system work, uh, uh, although it can be much more cumbersome and less efficient. Uh, mediocre people, time servers, um, can't make the best system produce good policy, and that's what we've got to keep in mind as we see every part of the government bloat to mm -hmm. such a point that they don't function. My view is it was in many ways humiliating for Secretary Rogers and many others. Mm -hmm. right? It did have an impact on morale. It was awkward. It was awkward for us who had to keep two or three different sets of memos and secret trips and back channels. We hadn't really talked about both telegrams that were done through the CIA and, and secret meetings and trips. But having said all that, you have to look at the results, which is what ultimately you, you're looking for. I think there were several factors that made it work. Uh, and we've already touched on them. The fact that you had a president that had this tremendous interest and background and strategic impulse in foreign policy, a strong national security advisor, the kind of issues that lent themselves to this kind of system. I mean, if you're dealing with Europe and parliaments and public opinion, it's going to be tougher to do what we did in some of these, uh, these other issues. But the final point I make, which we haven't touched on, is the relationship between Nixon and Kissinger. And it was unique. It was filled with tension and ambivalence. But it was tremendously successful, and here I give Nixon a lot of credit. He struck a perfect balance, in my view, between someone who was mired in details as President Carter, who had some good foreign policy successes, tended to be, uh, and the other uh, extreme of, of delegating all your foreign policy. I'm simplifying now to, to, to someone else. He set the strategy. Uh, but he knew in Kissinger, and he had the guts to appoint this man, as I said, there were so many different contrasts to him and was working for his opponent uh, before the election, uh, and had sufficient trust in him as a negotiator and the tactics to carry out the strategy. They would agree on the strategy, and then Henry would carry it out. And so you had Henry's strengths, uh, a, a conceptual view of the world that was pretty much strongly in parallel on all the major issues, and Nixon uh, willing to be in, certainly involved in making sure we did what we wanted strategically, but then letting Henry uh, carry it out. And I think that balance was a crucial factor in the success of the administration. Dick, do you want to finish? And then we'll go to Bud at the end. Well, there being nothing inherently wrong with the structure that was created at the outset of the Nixon administration, I saw no reason to change it by 1980 and 81. Uh, there was, it was a comprehensive system that in integrated all of the elements uh, of national power and of what we call nation, national security and the broadest possible implications of it. So uh, I continued it and uh, unashamedly so. The problem, one of the problems that arose, however, was at the very outset, um, Al Haig being named Secretary of State 
Reagan didn't really know Al very well, or hardly at all. But you did. Uh, I, but I did, and there, there, there's all sorts of backstories here that I won't, I won't even bother to get into, uh, interim in, uh, meetings that I arranged for Haig and, and Reagan. But Al wanted to run everything outside the three-mile limit. And on the first day, I'm just now contrasting, uh, first day of the administration, the very first day after the inauguration, that afternoon, presented a memorandum. And uh, I had seen earlier drafts of it telling him, saying to Al, it, would, it won't fly. It just won't fly with this man, this president, whom Al didn't know either. And uh, basically what happened was we had no crisis management until March 23rd, uh, that's almost three months or two, two and a half months, a long time into the first part of the Reagan administration. And finally, uh, the logjam, I broke the logjam by saying, well, because Al well, wanted it. Well, tell people what happened in, Mar in March. Well, oh, sorry, the, the president was shot. <laughs> president Reagan was shot at the Hilton Hotel. And I raced back to the White House to implement that which had been just approved on the 23rd uh, of March, seven days before the president was shot. And uh, it was crisis management. Uh, I had proposed to break the logjam, that Al wanted to do it, and it really belongs in the White House. That's exactly where it belongs, uh, to coordinate all of, the, uh, all of the elements flowing in, and uh, implemented that, that process, that led to some misunderstandings uh, about who succeeded whom that day, uh, a famous day. But the point was that the, the system really worked very well. And it works well when it, you have an organization of the type that Nixon set up in, with Kissinger and all of us in 1969. And that system functioned with huge elements of tension, as has been pointed out by, by my colleagues here. Yes, indeed. But the system worked, and you could drive decisions home. You can't do that if all of those decision-making elements are uh, dispatched to the bureaucracy. Todd, why don't, do you want to finish? Because then when you became National Security Advisor, you were one of the architects of winning the Cold War. Well, you're being very generous, but I think to your question, it depends entirely on the president and the degree to which he or she has the depth and vision of what American interests are and how they can be advanced and defended in their term of office. And then in addition to having some knowledge of what you want to do, you've got to have a sense of order and discipline. And looking back over the past several generations, President Nixon's model has stood the test of time of having very good people of equivalent depth of knowledge and understanding of foreign cultures from the Middle East to the Far East to Russia. Latin America, and able to manage a system both for planning, for decision making, and then for overseeing it that what you decide as the president gets done. So you need a, a highly talented group of people, but it's the president who sets the tone and cracks the whip and hires and fires and moves us in a constructive direction. President Nixon's legacy speaks for itself in all of these four areas we've discussed in overview here, from the China opening to ending the Vietnam War, to engaging the Soviet Union and reducing nuclear weapons over time later on, and the Middle East. Stability in those relationships, without question, were better at the end of the Nixon presidency than they when he had arrived, clearly. Uh, and then, that okay. model stood the test of time through, through the Reagan years. You know, I think it's, it's important, um, as everybody talks about the great successes of the 
golden era of American foreign policy, which was the Nixon-Kissinger period. What often people forget to talk about is the enduring legacy. Now, we know there was the enduring legacy of the policy themselves, the opening to China. I mean, China isn't where it is today without the opening to China and the Nixon administration. Arms control, arms reduction agreements never would have happened had they not happened. We've seen now the problems in uh, getting into wars and getting out of wars, so the Vietnam legacy, and certainly in the Middle East, we're still reaping the fruits of the peace of the Middle East that we've had since the 1970s. But what often gets overlooked is the enduring legacy of the people, the people who were on Kissinger's National Security Council staff. I mean, everyone is referred to the high quality of it. But when Henry Kissinger has his reunions, which happen every several years, and people come back, everyone in the room looks around and is stunned to see how many people went on from junior staffers under Kissinger and Nixon to higher positions in the Ford and Reagan administrations and people who went on to be cabinet officers themselves, national security advisors themselves, more ambassadors and flag officers than you can count. And it was not just what the policies themselves were, but the people who were trained under that system who then went on. I mean, the way I think of it is, you know, we walked with giants. You guys walked with giants when you were junior members, you know, young kids, to me, old kids, on Kissinger's National Security Council staff. But then you became giants of your own. I mean, Dick Allen, who was with Nixon on the Nixon campaign and Nixon's first deputy national security advisor, went on to work for Ronald Reagan, California governor, and was the tutor for Ronald Reagan's national security strategy in his campaign, and went on to be Reagan's first national security advisor. John Lehman, who was the junior guy working for Kissinger, who almost got fired that fateful day, went on to become Secretary of the Navy in the Reagan administration built the 600-ship Navy, and it was one of the architects, and it was really the 600-ship Navy, it was the naval presence of the United States that helped convince the Soviet Union they had no choice but to a cop to really, the Cold War was over by the time we got our 600-ship Navy. It took a few years to play out, but John then went on to do that. Winston Lord became the, the sort of main point guy for American-Chinese relations for 40 years. You were ambassador to China, assistant to secretary, for Asian Affairs, President of the Council on Foreign Relations. And so the job you may have started out with not knowing a whole lot about China, when I go to China today and mention the name of Winston Lord, you're kind of up there with the great superheroes. And then finally, Bud McFarlane, started out as Major McFarlane when I first knew you, um, went on then to become Reagan's National Security Advisor. And the Reagan Star Wars speech, the one that Bud wrote, um, talked about how the how the, the United States would develop a missile shield, but anyway, the, the, those are for a different time, and a different forum. But Bud McFarlane was one of the people who was the architects of the ultimate takedown of the Soviet Union, using all of the elements of American power. So the people who were in their 20s and 30s, in the Nixon in the Nixon administration, in their 40s and 50s, really became the men who won the Cold War. So I think maybe somebody's going to be on your speed dial wanting to know how we win the next one. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you, this has given you a taste and you come back to the subsequent Nixon legacy um, forums where we're going to talk about and drill down deeper into China, Vietnam, Soviet Union, and then this whole notion of strategic planning. So thanks so much for joining us. That's it. Thank you.